The story that I am about to tell you is the story of James Houston, an American fighter pilot who died in combat in World War II, who has been reincarnated with this young boy named James Tree. This is his documentary. system rebelled against the concept and the idea of reincarnation and past lives and now one of the biggest questions of life what happens when it's over heaven hell nothing or might there be a fourth possibility reincarnation could we come back as someone else here's Chris Cuomo with two down-to-earth parents who thought they understood the mysteries of life that is until their toddler began to talk on March 3, 1945, a 21-year-old Navy fighter pilot on a mission over the Pacific was shot down by Japanese artillery. His name might well have been forgotten, were it not for the remarkable, some might say unbelievable story of a little boy named James. Okay, this is me tough. I need somebody to help me. All right, I'm the volunteer. What do you okay. want me to do? Okay, I'm just going to climb this thing and you have to hold me in case I fall. Done. James Leiniger is all boy, six years old, and full of spirit. This is a special plane. It goes in reverse. You don't see a lot of that. James knows a lot about planes, especially war planes. What kind of airplane is that? It's a car, sir. His parents, Andrea and Bruce Leiniger, say from an early age, James would play with nothing else. He was obsessed with airplanes. If you look around the house, that's all you'll see. Airplanes, helicopters, aircraft carriers. But then, when he was two, the planes James loved suddenly began to give him frequent and frightening nightmares. I'd wake him up and he'd be screaming and he'd always be laying on his back, kicking his feet up at the ceiling. And I'd say, baby, what were you dreaming about? And he'd say, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. They sound like typical kitty nightmares, but Andrea says they went on the same way for months. Maybe too much TV, but James was just two, and his parents say only watching Barney and Teletubbies. Teletubbies! And Andrea and Bruce say they weren't watching World War II documentaries or conversing about military history. This is an F-18? No, that one. That's so okay. what explains the nightmares and James's strange obsession with airplanes? I talked to my mom about it a lot of times. My mom had said maybe he's remembering a past life. What did you say? Uh, politely, baloney. Andrea and Bruce of Lafayette, Louisiana are a highly educated modern couple. To them, the possibility that their little son James was manifesting signs of a former life was, well, a little out there. You know, having a past life is not the initial conclusion that you come to. You try and figure out any other way he could have did he see anything has there ever been anything on television anything that we've discussed but as time went by andrea didn't know what to believe here is james at age three going over a plane as if he's doing a pre-flight check he would continue to say and do things that were puzzling like the time his mom bought him a toy airplane and i said oh look there's a bomb on the bottom of it he said that's not a bomb mama that's a drop tank a drop tank. I did, I'd never heard of a drop tank. I didn't know what a drop tank was. Andrea's mother suggested she look into the work of counselor and therapist Carol Bowman. Bowman has written two books, both supporting the proposition that sometimes the dead can be reborn. We are taught from a very early age in this culture, in the Judeo-Christian culture, that reincarnation doesn't exist. Once you observe this in a child, and the evidence is very compelling, you have to open up to another explanation for what is going on. Bruce was deeply skeptical. He said there has to be a logical explanation. I don't believe in past lives. I don't believe in this stuff. But with the violent nightmares recurring three and four times a week, the Leinigers felt they had to do something. So with guidance from Bowman, they cautiously began to encourage James to share his memories. They say the result was startling. The nightmares immediately started reducing in frequency. Uh, he went down from three or four times a week to maybe one a week, one every other week. And at that point was when he started to articulate more about these past life memories. 
Seems normal enough, a little boy improving when his troubles are directly addressed. But Bowman says this is more, that James was forthcoming because this is the age when former lives are most easily recalled. They haven't had the cultural conditioning, the layering over of experience in this life, so that the memories can percolate up more easily. These memories tend to fade between the ages of five to seven. His parents say between the ages of two and four, James would reveal extraordinary details about the life of a former fighter pilot, mostly at bedtime when he was drowsy. Bruce said, um, what happened to your plane? He said, Cr it crashed on fire. And Bruce said, why did your airplane crash? And he said, it got shot. And Bruce said, well, who shot your plane? And I'll never forget the look on his face. He went, oh, the Japanese. Still, despite these extraordinary stories, Bruce remained dubious. Almost to prove they couldn't be true, he began to piece together the details James was sharing. And what he found, he says, shook him to the core. For in many instances, the stories appeared to match the facts. James seemed to be recalling real events, real people, in the life of a man who had been dead for almost 60 years. With each passing month, little James Leiniger seemed to be peeling back memories of a past life. Ooh, play. Vivid memories that scared and astonished his parents. Bruce had always said, what kind of plane did you fly? And he said, a Corsair. He said a Corsair. He said the word Corsair. Mm -hmm. Not only did James remember flying a Corsair, he demonstrated knowledge of the plane's peculiarities, like the time he was flipping through a book about planes when he was four. And he got to the Corsair and he said, that's a Corsair. And he goes, you know what, they used to get flat tires all the time. In fact, historians and pilots agree that the plane's tires took a lot of punishment on landing. Of course, this is a fact that could easily be found in books or on TV. But then, James began to offer up the kinds of specific details his parents say are harder to explain away. Another night, Bruce had come in and he said, do you remember where your plane took off? And he said it took off of a boat. Do you remember the name of your boat? Natoma. Do you remember what your name was? And he'd always say, James. But his name is James. It never really occurred so to us. We thought he just wasn't understanding the question. So I said, do you remember any friends or anyone else that you flew with? And he said, Jack. Jack Larson. Bruce began doing some research. Almost immediately, he discovered that the Natoma was an actual ship, a small aircraft carrier in the Pacific called the Natoma Bay. And Jack Larson, the Navy buddy little James recalled? Well, it turns out there was a pilot named Jack Larson who served aboard the Natoma Bay. In fact, he's alive and well and living in Arkansas. And it was like holy mackerel. I mean, really, you could have poured my brains out of my ears. And I just, I just couldn't believe it. And there were more clues. Around this time, James began signing crayon drawings and other artwork, James Three. One day I asked him why he's calling himself James Three. It was because I'm the third James. And every once in a while you ask him that today, and he'll still say the same thing. And one day, while leafing through a new book about the Battle of Iwo Jima, Bruce turned to an aerial photo of the Pacific Island. James was seated nearby. He pointed to it and he goes, Daddy, that's where my airplane was shot down. And, and I said, what? It's, that's my airplane got shot down there, Daddy. And I just went, um, I just went blank. I, 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 did, I, I, I couldn't say anything. By then, Bruce had become a man possessed, searching the internet, combing through military records, and interviewing men who served aboard the Natoma Bay. Finally, a breakthrough. He learned that there was just one pilot from the squadron killed at Iwo Jima. That pilot, James M. Houston, Jr. Is this why little James was calling himself James III? It just crystallized in my mind. This, this has to be who we're talking about. You know, my meter of skepticism was starting to go over toward belief. When little James would describe being shot down, he told of how his plane had sustained a direct hit on the end. We had an airplane, and I said, well, can you show me where it was? And he, he pointed right up to the front of the engine. That's what makes this man's story so intriguing. His name is Ralph Clarber. Clarber was a rear gunner on a TBM Avenger that flew off the Natoma Bay. 
On March 3rd, 1945, he took part in a raid near Iwo Jima. As it happens, Barber's plane was right next to the one flown by James M. Houston, Jr. It was to be Hughes' last mission before leaving for home the following day. As Barber recalls, the sky was thick and enemy flat. We experienced uh, pretty heavy in air craft fire, but uh, this was the most intense that I experienced uh, at, at any time. Suddenly a flash in the nose of Houston's plane. I saw the hit. I would say he was hit head on. Yeah, right on the middle of the engine. Just as little James had described it. But what do you believe now about your son James? I believe that he had a past life. I believe that his, in his past life he was James M. Houston, Jr. Uh, and he came back because he wasn't finished with something. And that's essentially what I believe. Dear Bruce and Andrea. And he's not the only one. This past October, the Leinigers received a letter from a woman named Ann Barron, the sister of pilot James Houston. Andrea and Bruce had contacted her about their little boy. Barron heard about what young James was saying, and she believes. All of this is still overwhelming. I can only imagine how it has affected you, but I believe with my love to you, Ann. The child was so convincing and coming up with all these things that there's no way in the world he could know. After my husband and I did extensive research based on what James had told us, we were able to determine that James was remembering the life of a fighter pilot who'd been killed during World War II at the Battle of, for Iwo Jima. His name was James M. Houston, Jr. And when his family sent us the initial package of photographs, we were amazed by the striking resemblance between... James M. Houston, Jr., the fighter pilot who was shot down in World War II, and our own son, James. I think that the parents are self-deceived, that they're fascinated by the mysterious, and they've built up a fairy tale. Professor Paul Kurtz of the University of Buffalo heads an organization that investigates claims of the paranormal. He's overhearing conversations of his parents. He's looking at cues. Uh, he may talk to his, his little friends or hear from neighbors and then this conviction that builds up that yes he was this pilot and yes he will come to believe that himself do you ever rack your brain and say gee i hope i hope i didn't say anything or do anything that put this in james head do you ever question yourself no or no no because I mean, we're talking to a two-year-old you know i mean what am i going to do sit him in a corner and say listen now we're going to concoct this elaborate scheme and you're going to imagine that you went through those things I knew what he watched on television. I knew what stories I read to him. I'm a protective, first-time Southern mother. There was no other place he could have been getting this information. Assuming the line is acting in good faith, what we have here is a classic conflict of faith versus science. Hard facts against beliefs that often can't be easily explained. There's no doubt where Paul Kurtz stands. People have a right to believe, surely in America, this freedom of conscience. On the other hand, do you want to believe in something that is false? So how do you rationalize a belief in anything bigger than ourselves if you have to fall back on science all the time? Uh, not simply science, on the facts, on common sense. Once upon a time, the Leinigers might have agreed, but like that was like before the amazing know? stories told by their young son forced them to consider the possibilities and to examine their faith. Whether you believe in reincarnation or not, it's about the eternal life of the human spirit. That's right. And that's something God promises to us. There is something else out there after this. It's not over when you die. James's vivid recollections are starting to fade as he gets older. But among his prized possessions are two gifts sent to him by pilot James Houston's sister. A bust of George Washington and a model of a Corsair aircraft. They were among the personal effects of James Houston sent home after the war. Do you feel differently about James? Has this changed your relationship with him? No. no. We, we have always felt that he's a special little boy because he's our son. Uh, he appears to have experienced something that I don't think is unique, but the way it's been revealed is quite astounding. Go. It, Good hit, buddy. it doesn't change how we think. Ready. I don't look at him and say, that's not my son, that's someone else. That's my boy. Right. Good one. It might be a natural assumption that it's just Buddhists and Hindus who believe in reincarnation, but would it surprise you to know that one out of every four Americans, Christians and Jewish alike, 
believe that souls do return again in different bodies. I eventually decided to focus on American cases. I took several trips to Asia, but I decided to focus on the American ones for a couple of reasons. One, they don't have the potential cultural influences that might impact the, the cases from Asia. And two, I felt like that they could have more impact on people, that they could be harder to dismiss if you realize that it could be happening uh, to the kid down the street. Um, so one in particular that I want to tell you about is, is uh, one that has gotten a fair amount of press. You may have heard about it. A little boy named James Leininger. Uh, the case has been on TV some. His parents eventually wrote a book about their experiences. He's a boy who talked about being a pilot who was killed during World War II, uh, and it's believed that that pilot has now been identified. So his parents are this Christian couple in Louisiana, and uh, his dad in particular was quite opposed to the idea of past lives before uh, this case began. Uh, it began when James was 22 months old, and he and his dad uh, took a trip to a flight museum. And James was fascinated by the exhibit of World War II planes uh, to the point that he kept insisting that they go back to it. And he and his dad ended up spending three hours at the museum uh, when he was 22 months old. And then a couple months later, around the time of his second birthday, he started having horrible nightmares multiple times a week in which he would be kicking his legs up in the air and screaming, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. And after I, I spent a weekend with the family going over all the details of the case, and then afterwards I talked with his aunt, who spent a lot of time with the family. She said you cannot believe how horrible these things were to witness, that it really looked like somebody fighting for his life. And then during the day, he would take his toy airplanes and he would say, airplane crash on fire, and he would slam them nose first, bam, into the coffee table. Uh, he would do this over and over again, and his parents are apparently tolerant people. Um, because this is a picture of their coffee table. I don't know how well you can see it, but there are dozens of scratches and dents where he would say, airplane crash on fire, bam. So that looks very similar to what we in children's mental health call post-traumatic play, where a child who has experienced or witnessed something traumatic then reenacts the scene over and over again in their play. And when you combine that with his nightmares, he really looks like a child who had been traumatized, uh, but he had not been, at least in this life. Um, and he didn't, but uh, many of the children who, who destroy violent lives, uh, show phobias uh, as well. And in the um, unnatural death cases, over 35% of the kids will have an intense fear toward the mode of death. Um, and the other thing that a lot of the kids will do in their play, they will also reenact compulsively uh, the occupation of the previous person. Uh, and in James's case, not only did he play with his toy planes a lot, but he, he took an old car seat and created a cockpit in the closet of his dad's home office. So his dad would be in there working, and James would come tumbling out of the closet as he was parachuting out of his plane. Um, and then uh, his parents were able to have several conversations with him uh, after his second birthday in which he could talk about this stuff while he was awake. Uh, what he described was that his plane had crashed on fire, uh, that he had been shot down by the Japanese, and that he flew a Corsair. Now, I'd never heard of a Corsair, but it was a um, special plane that was developed during World War II. And after this uh, case got some publicity, skeptics said, well, he just saw a Corsair at the museum, and the name stuck with him. And in fact, if you go to the website of the Flight Museum, you see that, in fact, there is a Corsair there. Now, James's dad said there was not one there when he and, and James visited, so I looked into it and found that, in fact, his dad was correct. Uh, they had had a Corsair. It had crashed at a public air show uh, the year before they visited, and then they didn't get a replacement for three more years. Uh, so that is not where he, he learned about Corsairs. He also said that he flew off of a boat, and his parents asked him the name of the boat, and he said... Natoma. In fact, his dad responded, well, that sounds Japanese to me. 
And James said, uh, no, it was American. Um, <laughs> so after that conversation, Dad went and did an online search and eventually came across information on the USS Natoma Bay. He printed out the information and the footer shows the date Uh, when he printed it out, 827-2000, James was born in April of 98, so this documents that by the time he was 28 months old, that Natoma was part of the story. And uh, it turned out that the USS Natoma Bay was an escort carrier that was, in fact, stationed in the Pacific during World War II. His parents would also ask him who he was during all this, and he always just said, me or James, which they didn't make anything of at the time. Uh, they also asked him one time who else was there, and he said, Jack, Jack Larson. This is all when he was two. Now, when he turned, uh, not when he turned, when he was two and a half, uh, his dad bought a book on Iwo Jima to give to his dad, James's granddad, and he was.